All right, good evening, class. Hope you're ready for day four of finance, real estate finance. Um, good news. After tomorrow, we're halfway done with the boring class. I know, I know. Y'all are excited. I'm excited as well. Um, this is definitely one of the roughest chapters, so, or roughest sections. In my opinion, so it was the worst section. It's, it's not a whole lot of fun to learn about, not a whole lot of stuff to learn. Uh, but they make it pretty important. Financing is pretty important in the, in the real estate process. So we're going to go ahead and start out tonight um, with another video. We'll have two videos tonight. Um, and then it's a short short lecture. We've got about four slides to go through. So um, it should be out pretty quick. And then let all you that have, to, have yet to take your test um, take it. So without further ado, without further ado it's old man. I'm the only one that did. Yeah. No, Biden. <laughs> yeah. Now I think uh, he's more competent. Is it very yeah. Speaks like we can talk about white ones. Hmm. The primary market is where loans are originated. The secondary market is where loans are sold. In the primary market back in the 2005 and 6 era, there was a lot of stuff going on and it led to mortgage fraud. One of the things you want to be aware of is how mortgage fraud can occur. And there's a lot of different ways that mortgage fraud has occurred and could occur in the future. But one of the things you want to know is that making false statements relating to a loan can be considered to be mortgage fraud. For example, if someone goes to a lender and falsifies income or assets, that could be considered to be mortgage fraud. Why? Because of the fact on the loan application, if you state that this information is correct, is true under penalty of perjury. Also providing false gift letters. We talked in another lesson about FHA and VA, and sometimes the borrower, in order to make the down payment, if there is a down payment or to beat closing costs, it has to rely on a gift from a relative. But sometimes what happens is they borrow that money from the relative, and I said borrow the money, but they, the relative signs a gift letter saying that it is a gift, but as a matter of fact, it is a loan. And if it really is a loan, and it winds up having to be repaid, that would be a false statement relating to the origination of the loan and could be considered to be loan fraud. You know, back around 2005 again, what we saw happening, a lot of the products, loan products that lenders had were called stated income, no doc loans, meaning a borrower could come in, say, this is the income I make on the loan application. These are my assets, but not have to provide the lender with any kind of backup documentation. And in many instances, they just flat out lie. And a lot of those folks eventually went to jail cost of the fact that they falsified that information and that was loan fraud. Another aspect of loan fraud would be to cause a lender to recur a higher loss than would occur if the lender had known all the facts. Short sales are a good example. So first of all, what's a short sale? Well, in a situation where, let's say a borrower put a loan on the property of 300,000 and because the market tanked, the property's now only worth $200,000, in order to sell that property, the lender has to take it into shorts. Well, not really, but the, that's not the why, why the term is used, but the lender is taking a short payoff to accommodate the sale of the property. If the lender were foreclosed, they would wind up with a property that they would have to resell. All right, that's a bank owned property. Uh, but rather than do that, the lender oftentimes would allow a short sale to take place, take a short payoff. And what we've seen happen, happening is some investors got to convince a lender that they should take a short payoff. Let's use some numbers, $300,000 original loan, property's now worth $200,000. The investors uh, cajole the lender into accepting $125,000 as a payoff on that loan. The lender, remember, is working at a distance. The lender is working through a call center here. So the lender doesn't have real boots on the ground, so to speak. So the lender accepts a short payoff of 125, even they're owed 300,000. And these investors 
immediately turn around and sell the property for $200,000. If the lender was aware of those circumstances, the lender would not have lost $175,000, would have only lost $100,000 if they were able to get a payoff of $200,000. But when, when this is done without the lender's knowledge and consent, that's considered to be loan fraud. Also, sometimes investors buy properties from that are Fannie Mae owned and Freddie Mac owned or bank owned, as we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. And a bank owned property, and again, they, they get a really good deal on this property and they turn around and flip it at a very substantial profit. Well, uh, the, the lenders oftentimes have restrictions on how soon an investor can turn around and sell these properties. In fact, the FBI keeps statistics on zero day flips, 30 day, 60 day, and 90 day flips. And there are rules against investors buying property and then immediately turning around and selling them at a profit. So any of these things could be considered to be loan fraud. And as a real estate agent, you want to make sure that you deal with people who are reputable. And if it doesn't seem like it's like it's reputable, you better stop it and say you can probably talk to your broker. So let's go beyond loan fraud. Let's just talk about some regular lending issues. The first one being discount points. Now discount points sometimes are defined in two ways. One way is that it's a means by which Collecting money up front will increase the lender's yield on the loan. Another way of looking at discounts and discount points is by paying some discount up front, by paying some extra money up front, the buyer buys down the interest rate. In other words, gets a lower rate of interest on the loan. But either way, discount points were invented by lenders. And so I always look at discount points being invented by lenders as a means of increasing the lender's yield. What do you need to know for the exam? Well, what we want to know is that discount points do increase lender's yield, and that one point is 1% of the loan amount. So when you're doing a math problem, one discount point is equal to 1% of the loan, not the purchase price, but the loan amount. And of course, the buyer or seller can pay. There is no restriction on who pays the discount. It's totally negotiated between the parties. Now, from a number standpoint, on a loan of $100,000, if the borrower paid two points, that's $2,000 in discount. If it was a loan of 150 and the borrower paid three points, that's $4,500 in discount. $200,000 loan with four points, that's $8,000 in discount. Why do they call it a discount? Well, take that $100,000 loan amount. If you're borrowing $100,000, but in return, you're giving the lender $2,000 in cash. The lender's actual cost on that loan is only $98,000. So they've actually placed a $100,000 loan. You sign a loan, a note for $100,000, but it's only cost the lender $98,000, and that's why it's called a discount. Another fee that we see in a real estate loan is an origination fee. An origination fee is really the brokerage fee that the mortgage lender receives. So there's no maximums or minimums. Oftentimes we see these as 1%, 1.5% of the loan amount. Sometimes they call it a point, but you've got to make a distinction between a discount on a loan versus an origination fee, which is really the brokerage fee on that loan. Now, discount points and origination fees, again, are always based on the loan amount. And in other lessons, we'll see some math questions where we deal with discount points and loan origination fees. Now, although this doesn't happen very much anymore, years ago, many of the loans out there were fully assumable without qualifying. In other words, if I originated a loan on property back in 1985, and two years later, I sold it, and you wanted to assume that FHA or VA loan or even a conventional loan, you could just go ahead and assume it, and the lender did not have to give its permission. Well, today, loan assumptions are not very common. Why? Because most loans have a due on sale clause in them, and rather than a borrower assume an existing loan, 
requiring the lender's permission because of the new on sale clause, the borrower finds it easier actually to go ahead and originate a brand new loan on the property. But let's talk about loan assumption because it does occur a little bit. First of all, with an institutional loan and even with some private loans, the seller of the property is going to have to obtain a written release of liability. In other words, if I have liability on a loan and I want to sell the property to you and you're going to assume the loan, I don't want to remain liable on that loan. So I've got to get a written release of liability from the lender. That's sometimes referred to as a novation. The term novation simply means new writing. New writing, novation. Now, when a loan is assumed, the, wouldn't you as the borrower want to get verification from the lender that I'm telling you the truth? If you're assuming a loan on my property, I might have told you it's $100,000 and the interest rate is 5% and the monthly payment is $800, whatever it is. Don't you want to verify that with the lender? So to verify that, usually the escrow company will request that the lender give them what's called a reduction certificate really more commonly called an assumption letter or assumption agreement. The reason it's called a reduction certificate in textbooks is because of the fact it tells the borrower who's assuming a loan to what point the principal balance has been reduced. So with a loan assumption, we have a verification document called a reduction certificate. Now let's talk about the primary and secondary market. The primary market is where loans are originated. And primary market lenders, sometimes called financial intermediaries, they take our savings, money that we put in savings or in other investments, and they lend it out to borrowers. The simplest example of these are savings institutions and banks, as well as credit unions. So let's say you put some money into a credit union, and a friend of yours from down the street comes into the credit union and says they want to buy a house. Well, the credit union can take our money or money that's pooled by a lot of different savers and lend it out to that borrower in the form of a mortgage on that home they're buying. So the primary market also consists sometimes of insurance companies. Although in residential lending, insurance companies rarely deal directly with borrowers. Insurance companies, however, do oftentimes make large loans on large commercial projects directly to the commercial borrower. Now, mortgage bankers and mortgage brokers often work within the residential market, and these are clearly some of the biggest of the mortgage lenders in the primary market. We won't go into the distinction between a mortgage broker and a mortgage banker, but most of the mortgage companies that you are probably familiar with are either mortgage bankers or mortgage brokerage companies. So let's see how the mortgage market works, how the primary market works. So you're the borrower and you're interested in buying a home and you go to one of the lenders in the primary market and you fill out a loan application and let's assume you're approved. Once you're approved and closing occurs, you sign the note in mortgage and then the lender gives you the money. So that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And what we don't often see is that the lender in the primary market only has a limited amount of funds. And if they were to make all the loans they could, then they're out of the lending business until such time as one or more of those mortgages pay off. So what does the primary market rely on and what do they do? Well, they actually rely on what's called the secondary market. The secondary market is a very broad market consisting of Wall Street, and other very large companies who are interested in holding mortgages on property. So the primary market lender actually takes a whole bunch of loans and, and adds them all together in a package and sells that note or those notes and mortgages, what's called assigns those notes and mortgages to this company in the secondary market. The secondary market then actually pays the lender billions and billions of dollars for those notes and mortgages. And guess what? That primary uh, lender, lender in the primary market, now has a whole bunch of money left and can make more mortgages to you and me as retail consumers. So when that happens, everybody's happy because I've got the loan on my home, the primary lender has made a profit, 
and the lender in the secondary market, the buyer, has also got a nice return on their investment. So when good loans are made, what do I mean by good loan? When the borrower has a job, has income, does qualify for the loan, this system works really, really well. Let's talk a little bit about the secondary market. That primary lender does not sell one loan at a time to the secondary market. They have to gather together a bunch of loans, maybe 10 or 20 or $50 million worth of loans for sale in a bulk to the secondary market. The process of, of gathering those loans together is called warehousing the loans. So that's the process of gathering together a group of loans for sale into the secondary market. And the process of selling them, transferring them over, is referred to as the assignment of that mortgage. Now we also have a document that might be involved in this process called an estoppel certificate. An estoppel certificate is a document through which the lender in the secondary market verifies the loan terms when the loan is sold. Can you imagine being the company in the secondary market, making sure, wanting to make sure that the loan is actually a valid loan? So that buyer in the secondary market could go to the borrower and say, we want you to verify the terms and conditions of this loan before we buy it. If they do that, if they ask for that, what they get is called an estoppel certificate. Estoppel certificates are also used uh, to verify the lease terms when rental property is sold. Imagine if you, as the buyer of a rental property, uh, wouldn't you want to know that those leases are valid? How do you determine that? You go to the tenants in that particular property and you ask the tenants to sign an estoppel certificate verifying the terms of the loan. We're talking about it here in terms of financing today, but we do not see, or we very rarely see estoppel certificates in residential loans. Why? Because again, they're selling these loans in 10 and 20 and $50 million blocks, and it's just not practical for the uh, investor in the secondary market to go to the individual property owners. Where we do see estoppel certificates used is in the situation where it's a single large loan, like a 10 or a 15 or a $20 million loan on a commercial property, that's where we see this happening. Another term you should be aware of relative to the secondary market is loan servicing. You know, oftentimes who owns the loan is not the one that you're paying your payments to. There are companies out there that specialize in loan servicing. In other words, we're collecting the payments and then passing them on to the ultimate investor or loan owner. I was at a seminar some years ago where Wells Fargo said, Wells Fargo only owned at that time 20% of the loans they serviced. So only one out of five borrowers who were making payments to Wells Fargo, the loan was actually held and owned by Wells Fargo. The other 80% of those loans, the Somebody else owned the loan and Wells Fargo was simply as, acting as the loan servicing agent. So who are the big players in the secondary market? The first is Fannie Mae, the Federal National Mortgage Association. They were actually created way back when in the 1930s to buy FHA loans. The other one, the other real big one is Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac is also a government institution I'm formerly known as the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation. They were designed in order to buy conventional loans from savings institutions. What Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do, first of all, is they set the standards for conventional loans. And what does that mean? Well, since they buy so many mortgages, that every lender out there wants to make sure that if they choose, that they can sell that loan to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. That being the case, Fannie Mae has criteria about the quality types, about the borrower's qualifications, et cetera. And all the forms, the loan application form, the mortgage or deed of trust, and the note are all Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac standard forms when you're dealing with conventional loans. They also buy conventional loans. That's their main purpose. They were set up to buy loans. So they buy these loans in the secondary market. 
they also sell loans. So sometimes they have a portfolio of loans that someone else might, might want to buy, and they sell those loans to other investors in the secondary market. Finally, they also sell bonds secured with mortgages. These are what are called mortgage-backed securities, or MBSs. Mortgage-backed securities are bonds secured with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans. And these bonds are sold to investors through the stock market. So that's a little bit about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Another institution you should be aware of who's in the secondary market or plays some role in what we call the secondary market is Ginnie Mae, the Government National Mortgage Association. This is a wholly owned government entity whose purpose is twofold. First of all, to issue the certificates backing FHA and VA loans. And secondly, to get involved with government subsidized housing. We don't have to get into any of the other details about Ginnie Mae, but just know that they exist. That's the Government National Mortgage Association. So that's the primary and the secondary market. And when loans are made based on good solid criteria, good solid borrowers, good solid properties, I bend the system works really, really well. That's our discussion on the primary and secondary markets. All righty, so uh, good job. Thank you for making it through that first video. Uh, I know it is very, it is very difficult to watch, uh, but there is some good information in uh, throughout the video uh, that you'll see kind of repeated in this slideshow. It's very quick uh, four slide slideshow that we got. There's a lot of repeat information. So after after we talk here, uh, you might want to go back and watch it um, just to kind of get a little bit more. Watch it again? Yeah, yeah, watch it again. <laughs> Learn more about the secondary market. Try to hit that two hours. Uh, can you throw that present for me? So yeah, as you all probably guessed, we're going to be talking about the secondary mortgage market tonight. Um, and can anybody kind of give me like a just a small definition of what the secondary mortgage market is after watching that video and, you know, kind of talking about what they did throughout the 08 financial crisis throughout this class, how they caused it. Can anybody, anyone online? Just a brief description of the secondary mortgage markets. I, I vote for Ms. Beer. She's going, right. to, she's going to tell Ms. you. Ms. Beer, just give me just, just a couple sentences. That's all I need. What is what is the secondary market? Um, just based off of the title. Yeah. It's a mortgage market. Okay. That's secondary market. Yes. Yeah. 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 You nailed it. You nailed it. Um, yeah. So really, the secondary mortgage market is the uh, government entities who buy the pooled loans from uh, commercial national uh, banks. Um, we've lend out the loans in the first place. Oh, I got a question, Professor. Yes. Is this where I can go borrow money from? Uh, unfortunately, you cannot. Why can't I? Because they're a part of the secondary mortgage market. You borrow money in the primary mortgage market. Yeah. That's the name, secondary. Yeah, so um, what I have written down here is uh, you cannot go to the secondary mortgage market <laughs> to, to borrow funds. So uh, that was a fantastic question there. Um, yeah, that's pretty much pretty much all I had written down for that. Um, so here are the members of the secondary mortgage market. Uh, these are all government entities um, ran by the federal government that deal with um, that deal in the secondary mortgage market, as we say. Uh, they are Freddie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae. The Federal Home Loan Bank, Farmer Mac, you have Remix, and then you also have the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Um, but the the majority, the ones that you will hear about the majority of is Farmer Mac, and then these first three over here, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae. Uh, you're going to want to know those names um, and, and what they stand for. Farmer Mac. Yes, okay. these first three over here, and then Farmer Mac are what you will hear the most. Um, from here on out. So, uh, talking, going into a little bit about Fannie Mae, uh, he obviously said in the video that they were um, created in the 1930s. 
uh, specifically 1934. They were rechartered in 1954 and then reorganized under HUD in 1968. Why? Can you tell me what HUD stands for? Yes. Uh, is it home and urban housing? And oh, urban. housing and urban development. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So they were reorganized under HUD. Like we said, HUD came in. Um, HUD continuously comes in and undermines everyone, uh, spikes up regulations. HUD's no fun, not cool. Um, so what Fannie Mae does is they pr purchase conventional loans and government loans through, uh, through administered, their, their specific administered price system. Um, Yeah, so um, in purchasing these loans, you know, kind of going back to the primary market and and what happened to, in 08. So we, we relay a lot back to 08 and kind of why that's so important is, I mean, it crashed our whole nation's economy and it was caused by the, the banking system and the loans for properties and houses. So what do you think, who did banks rely on back in the day when, you know, you would say, I want $300,000 for a house. Who did they rely on to, to trust you that the house was worth $300,000? Uh, appraisers. Oh, appraisers. Yeah, so appraisers would come in, and do you remember what kickbacks are from yesterday? Yeah, it was like, I think you got money after, after and they just said, like, I remember they yeah, yeah, yeah. making money getting kicked back. You're on track. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I would I would come to you as an agent. I would say, hey, you know, I know this house isn't worth three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Say say Stephen's my appraiser, and you're the bank, and I would say, hey Stephen, you know, I know this home isn't worth three hundred thousand, but you know, look, if you say it is, then I'm gonna get a bigger commission check. I'll I'll throw you back some of that money. I'll kick you back right. some of that money, and you know, we'll move on our way. The banks will never know. They trust us. Mm -hmm. They believe in us, and so that's really what tore down the, the economic that's not the only reason there was a lot um but that was one of the primary reasons that uh houses were being foreclosed on people were getting loans that they didn't qualify for um, paying in houses that weren't worth what they were reported to be as um, so they got really strict um, in the secondary market after that on their price system uh yes Mr. Yeah. Would, you, would you like me to go into a little more detail for them about what happened in 2008 yeah, you yeah, were I'm there, a, so you know. Yeah. I wasn't rapping, so. <laughs> so in 2008, what ended up happening was uh, the banks honestly and truthfully relied upon the licensed real estate agent, the licensed appraiser, and uh, even sometimes the, the home inspector. But they basically also relied or mainly on people being truthful and honest in their applications. And Miss Vera, do they, uh, do people always tell the truth? Yeah. Always, right? 100%? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. 1,000%. 1,000%. Miss mm -hmm. McKinney, you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You gotta give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, back then they did. They did. Until what happened was Mr. Wyatt said, I work for McDonald's as uh, just a person who gives the food, and I, I make $150,000 a year uh, at, at the as cashier. Yeah. The problem with that is, is what? It was a lie. He doesn't. He may make minimum wage. And banks, because they were getting so many loans, just what do they do? Rely on what the applicant was saying. And when you rely on what the applicant says, it's not always going to be true. Okay? And sometimes not intentional. Sometimes people, if they're self-employed, are not 100% certain. If you've ever been self-employed, most of y'all know this, sometimes you may have not done your taxes yet. Or you may think I had a loss or I may have had a gain or whatever, but you're not certain until you sit down and really run the numbers. So... What I tell people all the time is that some of it was intentional, some of it was in an unintentional, but it still came down to the point that people were what? They were dishonest. And when they were dishonest, it ended up 
they banks were basically giving loans higher, either higher than what the property was worth, or they were giving money based on an individual that was not making exactly what they were saying. They weren't verifying employment. So what happened was real estate agents, real estate appraisers would get together, like you were saying, uh, Mr. Aiden, you know, you go talk to, to Stefan and you tell Stefan, hey, Stefan, um, you know, I'm going to send all my stuff to you and you're going to appraise my houses and you're going to always make sure they're going to meet what the, the sales price is. That's your job. And as long as you do that, I'm going to keep funneling money to you and you're going to end up, you're going to make sure it happens. And you may kick me a little money on the side, but we're going to kind of have this little system that we got. Going That's so crazy. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is you go through this little quote unquote system. And even though Stefan knows that the house is not worth, say, three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand dollars, he thinks it's maybe worth two fifty. He still would get it appraised. Well, in that situation, is Mr. Travis the bank back here? He's relying upon, upon Stefan, who's his eyes basically on the property. And of course, Mr. Travis is also hearing from Mr. Aiden, and they're like, "Oh yeah, 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 it's working out and all this." So you're relying upon these individuals to be honest to you. And you're also hoping that Wyatt's telling you the truth too. Okay. So Mr. Eight, I mean Mr. Travis finally disperses the money. Come to find out that eight, I mean, Wyatt does not have that type of cash, nor is the house worth it. So when you try to go repossess it from Mr. Wyatt, you find out that that four hundred thousand dollar house you just gave out, guess what? It wasn't worth four hundred thousand. It was worth two fifty. And why it doesn't make that kind of money that you thought? And now, guess what? The bank is now screwed. Okay. See this big mess? See how quick it can get messy, really, really quick. But here's what's even better: it can get even more messier. Mr. Travis has now sold those off at the secondary market. So your loan, he sold your loan plus everybody else's loan in this class. He sold it off to me, Fannie Mae, who has bought all these loans up. So do you really and honestly get hurt? No, because I paid him to buy those loans. So he's got his money, but who does get hurt? At the secondary market, which can be investors, which can be the government, which can be many different types of people. And it ends up, it can cause them to go belly up. That's why banks are extremely strict now and i guarantee you you want to go through the application process you better have every single little thing you better have your firstborn ready because they're going to want to know all about it. okay so i'm just going to give you all a heads up that's why this part of the class is extremely important because when you're doing these things you've got to understand that when you're going through these methods and everything, you've got to be prepared for, you know, there can be fraudulent activity. And sometimes people don't, like you can, you can really, you can do your best to interview and prepare a client. But let me tell you, you will, and I promise you this will happen to all of you at least once in your life. Miss Vera, you get a phone call, I call you up, you're an agent. I call you up and I live in quote unquote California. That's where I'm living right now, okay? And so I call you and I say, hey, Ms. Beer, I see you got a listing at 123 Main Street. I want to put an offer in on it. You're going to be like, okay, well, don't you want to come see it? No, 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 I don't want to come see it. I just want I just want to put an offer in. Okay, well, I need, you know, documentation that you make this kind of money. Well, I, I, I'll get it. I just want to put an offer in. They'll end up, they'll be doing things behind the scenes to try to get this money to do mortgage fraud. There'll be people that will try to get Quicken Loans or other of these banks where they never physically see them. One of the key red flags is, say I don't call you, Ms. Fair, say I email you. If I email you and say I want to put an offer in and you say, well, give me a call, and I say, no, 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 I don't want to call you. You know, I want to, I want to talk all by email. That should be a red flag. You see what I'm saying? So you want to make certain that you're providing the information to these individuals so that they understand, but you have to, as a real estate agent, you got to watch these things because sometimes those can be red flags that you need to be aware of 
And if you ever suspect that there's mortgage fraud, you immediately need to, number one, talk to your broker first. After you talk to your broker and your broker is giving you direction, then most of the time the broker's going to tell you to contact the lender. And you're going to tell the lender. So you would call uh, Travis immediately and be like, hey, this Wyatt guy, something don't sound right here. You know, and then Travis at that point is then going to do what? He's going to reach out to Wyatt and try to get communication with him or at least put a flag in the file that I need to watch this guy. Does that make sense? So you got to be very careful when you're doing this. And that's why it's extremely important. Like Aiden's telling y'all, you've got to be watching these things because these things can fall back on you, even though you're being as innocent as can be. There are crooked people out there and you got to be prepared for it. So that makes sense. So if your gut ever, like they always tell you, if you, you got a bad feeling in your gut, go, go ask. It's better to just ask and find out, yeah, it's no big deal, than be like, yeah, I'm going to ignore it, and then it becomes a big deal. Does that make sense? All right, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Aiden. All right, thank you for that. Um, yeah, going back to Fannie Mae, uh, they sell, they also work in selling mortgage-backed securities, which we call MBSs. Um, and they were placed in conservatorship with the Federal Housing Finance a Agency, uh, the FHFA, um, then along with Freddie Mac in 2009 were put under the, the FHFA um, just to make sure they oversee their guidelines, uh, make sure they're uh, abiding by the rules and keeping up with their strict policies. Because as we go into this next slide, um, looking at the underwriting, uh, the underwriting standards for Pranny May, um, for some reason, they want you to know that desktop underwriter is the software that Fannie Mae uses. Um, I never had any, anything, I was never on any test that I saw or um, has ever come up in work, but they just want you to know that desktop underwriter is what they use. A lot of times why that comes up is you're, you'll never see it probably on your test. You'll probably never actually see it in person, but sometimes lenders will state that they're having issues with desktop underwriter. Okay. Um, or the or some people say that Ms. McKenna wants to, she doesn't want to do real estate sales anymore. She wants to get into the loan part. She just needs to be aware of that that is the platform. What is the okay, understood. Um, and then, obviously, talking about the guidelines for conforming loans, um, after two, 2009, since they were put under conservatorship, uh, these are one thing that you'll want to know is that these are very, very, very strict guidelines that they abide by now. Um, there's no faltering at all. If you do falter on any of these things, the loan will collapse completely. Um, they're very strict about everything, including the, the maximum loan amount that they set annually. Uh, how they how they come up with that amount is up to them, obviously. Um, they also they require that you get PMI private mortgage insurance. Um, if you have less, if you put less than twenty percent down on your loan, uh, they will require private mortgage insurance. And uh, what this pretty much is is if why you're going to buy that home um, and you're not able to put twenty percent down, well, this is insurance for the bank or the lender, whoever's giving you the money. Uh, that if you default on that loan. And they will get some or the whole amount that they loaned out to you. Um, it just kind of depends on circumstance, on the circumstances whether how much they'll get. Uh, but I mean, when you think about it, having to pay for private mortgage insurance now, um, especially with the guidelines being so strict, it's kind of it's silly and it makes a lot of people mad because I mean they go through such very they go through everything you have with a fine comb, making sure that you will be able to pay this loan. And the fact that they dug into your life so hard and still don't know or don't believe that you're going to be able to pay off this loan and you're having to pay for insurance on top of the loan itself uh, tends to make um, some people upset. So it's something good to know. Um, another thing they do, the down payment minimum for Fannie Mae is 5%. Um, and then the qualifying ratios, it's kind of hard to see here, but they're 28, 36 standard which that kind of that just means your uh, total your monthly debt amount can't be 28 to 30 percent to 36 percent over your monthly income 
income. Yes, your debt to income. It can't be 28 to 36 percent of your total income. Uh, so they are they are very strict, and like I said, if you falter on any of these or you don't qualify for any of these, um, they don't, will not take it. Don't be surprised if, like, for example, you go to apply now. Fannie Mae focuses mainly for individuals that are finding a home for themselves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It is not an investment, although there are some loans that are out there, but this is primarily a 203B is primarily for your own home, okay? Not for investment purposes. Uh, now, 99% of the time, it does not have to be 5% down. It can be three and a half, okay? So you can buy a house, $100,000 house for 3,500 bucks down. Okay. Now, with that being said, you say you have a lot of credit card debt and you got, say you got $20,000 in credit card debt and you have, you know, $15,000 in cash that you got in the savings account. They may end up telling you to take some of that cash to pay down those credit cards so you can meet those standard ratios on the debt to income. So do not think that I want to just go pay $3,500 down, go buy me a $100,000 house and get to keep my 15,000 in cash. They're not going to do that. They may also end up, they may say, let's put your debts, combine them together. Let's get all your debts and uh, consolidate them together so that your monthly payment is lower. Because remember, if they're at 20% and you got a lot on it, it's a lot of payments. So if we consolidate everything and put it into a lower loan, we might can make your payments from 1500 a month to maybe 750 a month, which then might help you in that situation of meeting that standard for the DTI, the debt to income ratio. Um, so there's a lot of different ways. Now, Ms. Vera, do you think that I, as a broker, should go out and tell my clients, you know, how to do this word for word, how to, how to go through it? Is that my job? No. My job is to do what? To assist them in my that's right, buy them home, help them, show them houses, represent them in negotiations and things like that. But this is not my forte in regards to telling them how to do these things. Thankfully I can, I am licensed, but if I wasn't licensed, I could not say that information. So what do you do in that situation, Mir? What if, if McKenna came to you, she's got a lot of credit card debt, needs to buy a house, and um, but she also makes a decent income. Do you, what should you do there? Should you refer her out to anybody? Well, what I would advise is that you try to bring down some of that debt, but... Um, but do you, would, should you even tell her that, though, to bring down the debt? I don't know what I would. You shouldn't. I shouldn't. You want to know why? Because what if she puts the money into the wrong type of debt? Yeah. Because some debts are not always classified in the DTI. Yeah, like medical. There you go. So what if McKenna took the whole 15000 she had and paid off all her medical expenses? Uh huh. And then who's she coming back after? There you go. So in that situation is, the best thing is, is Ms. Ferry, you would say, let me get you in contact with Wyatt, who's a lender, and Mr. Wyatt can go through all the numbers and kind of help you determine where you should put your money. And then Mr. Wyatt has now got that liability and burden on him, to run those numbers and to help her figure it out. Does that make sense? So just push it on the loan. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's their, that's, 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 that's their job. That's their job. That's, their that's job. why they're licensed. So you want to try to always sometimes quote unquote delegate certain things. Okay. And you'll notice, and y'all probably have noticed in this class, compared to Mr. Travis's class, there was a lot of information. He had a lot of stuff to share with you. It was a lot of basically reinforcement of what Stefan taught you. But if you notice in this class, there's very few slides. Why is that? Why would you think they're not going into a lot of detail, Travis? I'm sorry, Aiden. Uh, well, I think there's a there, there is a lot of information that they would learn to read out of the textbook. If but here's the thing. What if, say for example, Sheldon, you go into a lot of detail and, and provide a lot of information to Sheldon? What happens if Shelton starts giving advice that requires a license? They're going to come after me. No, they're not coming after you. They're going to come after her. Yeah. Because of the fact is, is that what? 
she is she's giving advice. It's just like practice of law. She's practicing something that she's not licensed in. So you need to know the basis of it, but you also need to know where your boundaries are with your license. Does that make sense? That's why y'all probably been noticing a lot of these slides. There are very few. Aiden's made that clear to me. He's like, there's only four slides. I'm yeah. like, that's, that's right. There are very few because if we give too much information, what do people like to do to prove themselves to be smart, Travis? What do they like to do? Explain. Explain everything in detail. And when they do that, Ms. Beer, what happens to them? Um, it opens them up to what? Potential yeah. lawsuits. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Because like I just used that one example with you, Ms. Beer, where you about McKenna. You were just trying to be helpful. That's what yeah. you were trying to be. But what if Miss McKenna, now McKenna, I'm coming to you. What if Vera told you that and you went and took your 15000 and paid off all your medical and then go to Wyatt and find out, oh, yeah, none of that's actually going to help you. Now what are you going to do, Miss McKenna? Uh-huh. And are you going to end up, are you going to possibly sue her? Probably. There you go. Do you see the problem here? That's why when you're going through these classes, understand that we're giving you just a very broad understanding but ultimately, who's, who, is in, or who is responsible for getting the proper information to them? The lender. The lender. And I'll tell you all this, by the way, just FYI. Do not be surprised, and I promise you this will happen. Do not be surprised if other individuals, like home inspectors or appraisers, don't end up coming to talk to your clients, okay? I've had this situation before. I'm a home inspector, okay? And, and Travis, you're the real estate agent. Aiden, you are the, uh, the, the client. And Travis, you're just way too busy to go to the inspection, okay? So, so I go out here and I'm starting to look over the property and I'm like, God, that's terrible. Oh man, that's horrible. Oh God, who is your agent? Man, named Travis Stahl. Oh, God. Is he, I've never heard of him. He, he's a nobody. That's ridiculous. Yeah, he, he's nobody. God, wait, that, and how much are you putting in on this house? Uh, 15000 No, 35000 <laughs> You mean, <laughs> mean 235000 yeah. Oh, how much you buy in for the whole house? Oh, I thought you meant oh, down How much you buy, oh, you buy this like, house for? 275000 God, and, and he told you to put that? Yeah, he said it was a good price. Damn yeah, right. God, you see this thing over here? God, look at this. Horrible. The whole thing is just about to collapse in. I mean, he's an idiot. I would you don't want to buy this. Trust me. You don't, Aiden, you don't want to buy this house. You 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 know what? I've got a very good friend of mine. Her name is Miss Vera. Sweet lady, smartest lady in the entire world. Here's her card. Okay. Call her. I got you. <laughs> now, do y'all think that happens? Yeah. Every single day every single day so now am i within my ram wyatt me being a home inspector mm -hmm. am i doing my job honestly be honest be honest Heck no. do i hold do i hold, do I hold a real estate license travis no no i'm a home inspector so my job is to do what McKenna? inspect the home am i supposed to be giving him advice on prices of the property no. There are people that will do that. Travis, how do you feel if I did that to him and you're the agent? You gonna use me again? Fight somebody. Yeah, right? The, so the point is, and this is the whole thing you gotta keep in mind, is what is my job? What is my job? What's my license for? My license is to do what? To, am I supposed to be giving financial advice? Am I supposed to be going, I mean, like I tell people all the time, if, if I'm a broker, should I be going out inspecting homes? What if I know, Vera, okay, what if I take in classes on how to do home inspection? That's all I need, right? Let's start giving people advice on that, right? No, I've got what? I don't have a license. So it's very clear in this point that you have to understand, and that's something also I can kind of tell him, while there's very few slides, there's a reason for it. Because you will see in this industry that even appraisers will come out. And they'll look at a property. And Stephan, it's your house that you're selling to, to Aiden here. Now I'm an appraiser. 
And I come out, I'm like, man, Stephen, this is a great house, beautiful house, really nice. Man, this is, godly. this is, how much are you selling this house for, Stephen? Oh, I'm selling it for, what did you say? $275. $275. Oh, no, Stephen. God, Lee, you could have at least got $350. Who's your agent? Oh, it's Wyatt Campbell. Oh, so that got an idiot anyway. <laughs> here, here, here's your card. Here's Miss McKenna. You need to call her. Can I do that? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Because I'm not a... And this, I'm an appraiser. Yeah. Okay. I yes, I can value it, but here's another thing: is you're represented by Travis. The bank has hired me to come out on your behalf to value the house. Why in the heck am I even telling Stephen anything about the value of the house? Who's paying for it? Right. You. Um, not seller, him. The seller never sees the appraisal. Should, should never. Yeah. Should never. Should never. And, and inspections as well. So in that situation is, and this happens, there are appraisers that are out there that will walk around and the seller will be in the house and they will walk around and be like, yep, this house worth three fifty. Uh, I can't get you a report, but it's worth three fifty. And then go back and send it back. And they won't send it even to his own agent. They send it to him because he's paying for it. So they send it to him. And he gets the appraisal for three fifty, but now what's happened? You find out your house is worth three fifty. Who are you coming after? Your agent, because your agent did not do his job. Do you see how there can be problems here? Mm -hmm. So, what's the best thing, McKenna, that you should do to stop things like that? Should Travis have been at the inspection? Yeah. Should. Eight or should Wyatt made certain that Stefan was not at home during the appraisal? Yes. Do you see kind of what I'm saying? You are never too busy. That's what happens to a lot of agents. They get too busy too quick, and when they get too busy too quick, what happens? They start missing or start to miss appointments, inspections, appraisals, WDI inspections, all of these things. They miss them because they think, well, it's no big deal, and sure enough, the buyer is going to show up at their new house. They're going to be there. And he's going to follow the inspector around like a little baby. Okay? He's going to follow them around and look at everything. And sure enough, Miss Vita, if I'm following you around, it's just going to be awkward if you don't talk to me, right? So what do you feel obligated to do? Talk. And I'm going to be asking a ton of questions. And eventually I'm going to say, well, what do you think this house is worth? And then what's she going to say? Well, I don't want to look bad at it. I think it's worth why. And then all of a sudden I call Travis and say, well, I talked to the inspector, Travis, and they said it's not worth that, Travis. You, you need to fix it, Travis. Had Travis had been there, what would he have done? Travis would have kept me from the inspector, kept me occupied, and then when the inspector's done, then what would have happened? What would you tell me? Once Vera, Vera is done, what would you have told me after she's done? Can I go talk? Can we now go talk yeah. as a team? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So now we can all come together. And then, Travis, what if I ask this? Well, so what do you think the house is worth, Miss Vera? What's, what, what is that? What is <laughs> to stop me right there. Yeah. So he don't, so. She, she don't know. She has no idea. Yeah. You, you need to talk to me. That's, that's a question for me. Well, that's what I do. Yeah. So that's why in those situations you need to be there. Because if you're not there, what ends up happening? You end up, if you're not there, you're going to have these problems. Does that make sense? Okay. That's why sometimes information overload can be a big situation. I remember when I sold his mama's house. Uh, if you remember, the inspector went out there. And I mean, he was ripping up the floor. I don't know if you remember that. But he pulled the floor back, showed her there was a crack and all this. But I was at the inspection. And when they started talking about numbers, I jumped in and talked to his mom. I was like, well, this is what we need to ask for, da, 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 da. I did not leave it to the inspector. And that's why it's very important that you check your inspectors, because when you check who your inspectors are, you begin to trust them. I now do not have to go to inspectors, because I know my inspector. I can send my inspector out by himself with, with Travis's brother. I said, Travis, here's, here's the guy I use. He'll take care of you. Just meet him out there. He got you. 
Did he at any point ever try to take your client? Not once. Not once. Not once. And you know what, guys and gals? He's a real estate agent, too. He's a real estate agent. But we have a good enough rapport that he knows not to try. Yes, he is a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. That boy's going places. Yes. But that's what I say is, just because you know this, you need to know of this, but you don't need to know too much in depth. If you want it to become a loan officer, you can. There's a two-week course, and you go through it. But... I don't recommend doing both at once, okay? You need to get one of them down where you know it, and then if you later on down the road want to jump into it, great. But you don't need to know too much because a lot of times you may share too much, and that can get you sued, okay? And we don't want that. We're not all like Wyatt with the black card, if you know what I'm saying, so. <laughs> Can't get out of everything. That's right. All right, go for it. All right. Uh, so yeah. Uh, qualifying ratios, 28-36. We'll move past that. Uh, I'm talking about seller contributions that can be made to the buyer at closing. Uh, their requirements are 3 to 6%. Um, and there are people have ran into issues where seller, you know, really just wanted to get out of the house. I'm selling it for about 200000 and so the buyer, there, were, there was a lot of problems with the house. And the buyer wants, you know, twenty thousand in concessions to re to make all the, the just repairs and everything. But with the three 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 to six percent, uh, and the six percent being the maximum contribution that a seller can make, um, obviously twenty twenty thousand is ten percent of two hundred thousand. Um, so, how would you? Can y'all think of any ways of how you'd go about um, making adjustments in the contract? after going through law of contracts, how you would go through, back through and adjust that so we could get this seller contribution down to 6%, but still keep the, uh, yes, keep it keep it in flow and the buyer still received 20,000 in concessions, but the um, this taking the seller concessions down to 6%, if that makes sense. You may want to walk them through it because that kind of even yeah, that was that was a really rough way of explaining it. Okay, so really what what I'm saying is is a seller is selling his house obviously to the buyer. There's a lot of repairs that need to be made. He's selling it for two hundred thousand. The buyer needs twenty thousand in cash back from the seller to make repairs on the house so it's livable. Twelve thousand, sir. Twelve thousand? Is that what's that? You want me to step into it? Well, yeah, you, you can. I, yeah, I don't know where you're going with the 12,000. Yeah, okay. So, Mr. Wyatt, you want to buy Miss Vera's property, okay? She's selling her property for $200,000. That's about the average right now, okay? You go out, you want to, you need, you want to buy it. You do, you hire Miss McKenna. She goes out, she inspects the property, and Miss McKenna tells you that, first off, understand what uh, FHA loans, you have to, and VAs, some of them require WDI inspection, wood destroying insect inspection. And they find out as they're going through the loan or through the, the inspections, Ms. McKenna finds out that there's about, you know, six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars worth of damage from just termites. And then there's some other things throughout the house that need repairs. So it comes out to about twelve thousand dollars. Okay. But you also want to be competitive because it's a hot market right now, isn't it, Travis? Mm -hmm. So you want to be competitive. So you don't want to go in and say, Miss Vera, I'm going to buy your house for $200,000 and I want you to give me $12,000 back. Right? Because then that means technically what's the house worth? Well, you take two hundred dollars minus $12,000 and that gives you what you're actually offering her. All right? Well... Ms. Beer, if you have a conventional loan from me for two hundred thousand with no seller concessions, and you've got Wyatt who has two hundred thousand, but he wants twelve thousand dollars in repairs, which one are you gonna take? Mine, right? Because I'm not asking for any repairs. He is. Yeah. So how could Wyatt adjust it? What could he do, Travis? What? 
Well, actually, scratch this. What could he do, Aiden? Adjust the sales price. And how does he do that? Raise it up that $12,000. And then what does he do? Put those $12,000, I mean, he raises the sales price $12,000, uh -huh. but also put those back into seller concessions, so the offer is still at $200,000. Does that make put sense? Put it in that two twelve. Yes. So put an offer in at two twelve. Yeah. But Okay. We all kind of agree that it's two hundred. Miss Fear is like. Where does the twelve thousand come from? Like I, I got it except where it came from. Well, let me. While he's doing that, let me tell you this also, guys and gals. He's gonna pull it up. But let me also tell you this too. Okay. So if let's work this out. Why you have submitted Miss Fear a contract for two hundred twelve thousand dollars with twelve thousand in concessions. Mm -hmm. When we talk seller's concessions, always think it subtracts from the sales price. Does that make sense? So whatever's in seller's concessions is subtracted from the sales price, which Travis can go to the sales price booth right there. Yeah. Welcome so, back to problem head points. Yep. Whoa. So, <laughs> so you see that sales price C right there, whatever number is in there in C, is going to end up being subtracted from seller's concessions. Okay, so if Wyatt puts two hundred and twelve thousand dollars in there, like that, and Travis, go down to uh, try to find it. The seller's concessions, okay. and you put in there twelve thousand. Miss Vera, how much is Wyatt actually offering to buy your house for? I tell you. No. See, that's where I need to do it. How much? Right. So, if you remember when we went through the contract, paragraph 12 is basically the expenses the seller's willing to pay. Mm -hmm. And all this link is is the buyer asking for extra money. Mm -hmm. They're just asking for money to come back to them. Mm -hmm. And so, what you'll see a lot is you'll see people who put in, let's say, $200,000, and then they get another offer for $200,000, but they ask for $12,000 in concessions. It's basically what this link is here, and all they're doing is asking for. I'll pay you two hundred thousand dollars as long as you can pay me twelve thousand dollars. So they're not actually paying you two hundred thousand dollars; they're paying like to fix their property usually. Yeah. Fix it. Okay. Yeah, and so that's what this comes up as: a two hundred thousand dollar offer with nothing here is the same as this offer, which is two twelve, and then has that twelve thousand there. I get it. Michelle, are you there? I am. How are you feeling, by the way, Michelle? I am in recovery. <laughs> Good. Miss Corey, how are you doing? I'm okay. So, so. so. Is this not making sense? Be honest. Oh, yeah, this is making sense. I'm trying to study as well. Sorry. You're good. You're good. All right. Gio, you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Miss Coleman, you good? Yes, I'm good. So here's what I'm going to tell you. You might all want to, the reason I was picking on everybody, because I want everybody to hear this. Here's the good part. Y'all ready? All right. Here's, here's a little trick that I want y'all to learn is real estate agents. All right. This is the juicy stuff. Just scroll back up, or actually right here. All right. Y'all see right here where he's got sales price 212. Okay. But he also said, what did he tell you, Miss uh, Vera? He said that you're giving him also... 12,000 back as concessions, which means for the repairs, right? So truthfully, your offer that you're getting is $200,000. Because what am I doing? He's giving you 212, but what are you doing? Giving 12 back. So it's still $200,000, period. So from your side as the seller, you're only getting 200,000. But from my side, as a broker who's representing you, oh, yeah. how's my commission being based off of? 200 no, 212. or 212? 212. 212. So sometimes you will see agents that want a nicer, bigger check who will put 300 up here with, remember, you can only go up to 6% on certain loans, but they'll do the whole 6% down in seller's concessions and end up, what's their commission based off of? 
that three hundred thousand break everything down, even though the yeah. seller is getting two hundred thousand. They're actually getting slightly less than that because they have to pay the twelve thousand plus a little bit extra in uh, commissions and everything. So they're actually paying they're getting slightly less, but for the most part, it's the same thing. But like I was doing a transaction once, and they we had an offer in for three fifty with seven thousand dollars in concessions, and we said we can't do that. The house is listed at three sixty five. Like that's not what we're asking for. And he was like, "All right, how about?" What if we do three forty nine, but you only have to pay us six thousand dollars? And I was like, one, that's the same number. You just you just mapped it out slightly differently, yeah, and awesome. the only thing that changes is that it gives me less money. Yeah, like it's like this changes nothing else except for my commission. That's the only way you do it. So, and that's what happened. Yeah, so no, this is like, that's that's what happened. So, Miss Beer, imagine this: you've got an offer from Aiden for two twelve. With twelve in concessions, mm -hmm. and you got one from Wyatt for two hundred thousand no seller concessions. Be wrong. Which one are you gonna pick? Two twelve. Two twelve. Yeah. Why? 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 So let me let me explain why. So let me let me come back for a minute. Okay, I was gonna say yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let you talk. Yeah, I just have an excuse to get on that. Okay, so now I'm confused. Okay. Let me stop. Let's let's talk about this. Okay. Let's talk. You're the seller. Okay. You're a seller. He offered you a house or an offer for two twelve, but he wants twelve thousand in concessions, which he wants you to give him twelve thousand at closing to fix stuff. Wyatt is giving you two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, nothing, no request. Two hundred thousand. Which one actually gives you the most money? My commission as a broker is going to be based off of what with his? It's going to be higher with his. That's 212. Mm -hmm. But you're actually still getting 200, really. Mm -hmm. But you're going to pay more in commissions to me than you would because I'm going at a higher price than if you went with Wyatt, who was 200,000, you would have broke even. Mm -hmm. you, would have, you, would have, you would have paid a lower rate. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at spending more going this route mm -hmm. than you would going with white. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, let me go one more step and I'm going to try to talk. That this is why VA loans oftentimes are not as competitive yeah. as FHA and conventional because most, not all, most VA loans require that the seller give back a certain amount of money to pay for closing costs. So that means this number is always going to be higher. And down here, it's going to also have this, although they may still be the same, they may both actually be 200. The commission, because the seller pays, is going to be more on a VA loan than you would on a conventional loan. Does that make sense? Does that clarify? Wyatt, do you understand? Everybody online, do you understand if so put thumbs up? You don't have to talk. There you go. All right. All right. Keep going. So yeah, that's basically what I was trying to get at. That is the, the situation that I was trying to explain. Oh, here we go. Yes. So the reason why I have a problem with that is because you have to pay interest on those twelve thousand dollars as the buyer. I think that's why I have the issue. What interest? You through the um, that that's from the buyer side, not your side. Though. Yeah, you're the seller. I said. Oh, okay, never mind. Not a problem for you. No, no problem. Okay, go ahead. All right, cool. Yeah, I was gonna say you, you you see that a lot of times if somebody needs they're doing a certain type of loan or they actually need more money back to to cover stuff like they're not gonna have enough money left over to cover things. They'll do a loan like that where they still will get a loan and be approved for something, but they need that ten thousand dollars right now in order to do this. Like they want to build something on the property or whatever, and they want to do that right away. They'll do a loan like that because then they actually have ten thousand in cash to do it, like to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that a lot in that sense. Yeah. All right. Um, then talking about uh, jumbo loans, uh, these are FHA loans that exceed the loan limit. Um, obviously, 
they have the maximum set annually. Um, these are called non-conforming loans. If these are typically high high value houses, you know, in the five hundred thousand plus range uh, is what they consider jumbo loans to Fannie Mae. Um, and then talking about Freddie Mac here, uh, it was established in 1970 to provide second mar secondary market savings for associations, uh, purchases conventional as well as government loans. Um, and as I said earlier, talking about Fannie Mae, uh, Freddie Mac was placed in place under conservatorship with FHFA in 2009 due to that 08 financial crisis. Uh, the Freddie Mac underwriting standards they're similar to Fannie Mae, uh, but they use only the debt to income ratio. Um, whereas Fannie Mae used all those the other bullet points uh, that we went over, they use solely the debt to income ratio. And uh, as we said in with Fannie Mae, that they used the desktop underwriter. Uh, Freddie Mac software is the loan prospector. So some more just general information there. And then their standards are what they call the QRM or the Qualified Residential Mortgage Standards. Um, and then just a little bit more about the secondary market. Jenny May is another one that I said you would hear, I hear quite a bit. Um, it guarantees FHA and VA mortgage-backed securities. Uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank, they buy loans from savings associations. Uh, Farmer Mac provides secondary market for farm loans, as we talked about in detail yesterday. And remix are those the real estate mortgage investment conduits for the pools of mortgage backed securities. Um, so that's going to be it for the slideshow today. Uh, we're going to have just another quick video. Um, I know, I know, I'm sorry, uh, but this one is this is an actual good one. Um, it's actually by done by a teacher um, who is talking to students uh, who are also trying to get their real estate license, and he asks. Um, he asks questions about the secondary market and kind of guides them through the steps on how to get to the answers of those questions. Actually, so, this gentleman here, is this the one that I used before? Yeah, no, yeah. that's correct. This one here is actually very beneficial to y'all because he actually goes through questions that you might see on your exam. And when I used to go through and, and when we do the prep course, you'll have me tell you to listen to him a lot but he gives you a lot of insight and actually goes into it. So it's going to be like a, um, like on the phone type deal where he's talking back and forth with the person, but uh, the questions he brings up and the information he provides is very useful. So definitely, I know some of the other ones have been kind of boring. This one's actually a good one. I would, I would personally recommend y'all stay and, and listen for it. Okay. Hello, this is Joe from Prep Agent, and I am here today yeah, no, with Carol, a new quick. student and ready to pass her real estate exam. Hello, Carol. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? Here. Pretty good. Not as good as you say you are, but you're a little nervous. You call me a little bit of panic, right? Well, yeah, exactly. This isn't the most fun stuff in the world, but I gotta do it. You gotta do it. We'll make it a little less painless, and we're gonna focus on a topic that was giving you a little trouble. And what topic is that? Um, I should really miss it <laughs> The real estate thing. The secondary market. Yeah, I know. Yes. I was about it. I know the whole exam for you, Dante, but we were talking yeah. about the secondary market. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of people do because when you study other stuff like appraisal, it's much more tangible. You see the properties. Definition a little simpler. The secondary market is very ambiguous to people. It's not something your average person comes across. So it's a little harder for people to wrap their head around. But we're going to try and make it a little more manageable for you today. So we move forward, it's less daunting on the real estate exam. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Um, and let's narrow down our points of trouble from real estate exam to more specific things. Okay. Okay, so first thing, first piece of advice to give everybody, don't overthink stuff. Remember, oh, my, my motto, smart yeah. is overrated. You don't want to overthink everything. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. Keep it concise. Um, you can get very involved with the secondary market, but there's just a few simple things you need to know. And it all starts with this. The secondary market is the resale marketplace of loans. 
Can you, can you read that back to me? The secondary market is the real resale market of loans. Do you know what that means? Oh, uh, not really. It doesn't matter. You see that? Circle it on your tail. Okay. Even if you don't know what it means, just circle it. Because okay. that is the core of it. Now I'm going to explain a little bit of what it means, but this yeah. is the core of everything. So remember it like it's Greek or whatever language you know that on. The secondary market is the resale marketplace of loans. Okay. Are you a history buff? In some areas. Okay, so sometimes knowing the history of something will really help explain the concepts. So let me take you back to 1934. Tell me what you know about 1934. The Great Depression. There you go, draw and roll. Great okay. Depression. What do you think, now you obviously don't know this much detail, but you're a smart person. What do you think real estate-wise is going on during the Great Depression? Uh, my guess would be hard times, uh, deflation. Okay. So really it was a society full of renters. And what I mean by that, only the very rich could own property. So most of the society has rent. And as you go into real estate, you know that to build wealth, you want to own property. So it's a classic case of the rich getting richer and the poor struggling to keep up. Because as we know, poverty can be like quicksand. And part of that is paying exorbitant rents, try to keep up where you're not getting any money back through um, equity building and the appreciation of the property. So that was part of the problem of the Great Depression. Let me get a little more specific. Back then, to get a property, you have to put down 20 to 40% on the property, 20 to 40%. That's a lot of money. Think about terms today. We don't put nearly that amount down on our property. True. Yeah. And the loan amount was seven years. So it was a seven year loan and it was a straight note. Okay. Meaning you only paid the interest seven year loan. So if you think about it, what's the issue with that? The issue is most people can't afford it. Yeah, so most poor people can't afford but 20 40% down. Even today, that wouldn't be sure. realistic. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to do it either. Yes. Okay, so 20 40% was a large down payment. And in seven years, the bank would have the money back. So what does that mean? That means the bank had money to lend out over and over again. So remember, they were getting 20 40% down, and the loans were being repaid back after seven years. Okay. So it worked for the banks. They could keep lending to the rich people who could afford to take out the loans, but the lower class and the poor was left out. This made things a lot worse, and it helped attribute to the Great Depression. So what happened was... Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write essays that inspire, messages that forge brighter connections, and emails that get the job done... That's what I use. You need to think about more than just grammar. In 1934, okay, so 1930, 31, 32, remember Shirley Temple? You were a big fan of hers, right? <laughs> yeah, she's cute. Yes, 1930s. 1934, something happened in the real estate world. Very exciting. You know what it was? No. Something called the FHA. You ever heard of the FHA? I certainly have. Yes, it's probably something you saw in your books, but you were like, what's that about? I've heard of it, but I don't exactly know what it is. Okay. So what the FHA did is they stepped in. And this was a government organization that said, we got to do something about this. It's getting out of control. Depression's going crazy. So what the FHA did is they decided to insure the lenders from loss. They told the lenders, hey, instead of doing this, seven year and 20 to 40 percent why don't we do something more reasonable like three percent and why don't we do it over the course of i don't know 30 years which is more what you see today that 30 yes. year loan the banks were like well that's crazy we don't have money to lend out what if people default and fha said no worries we will insure you from loss so if anything happens we got you covered but in doing that, a new problem arose. What do you think? So now banks were collecting. So you want to get a house. You gave me 3% and you're going to pay me back over 30 years. Okay. 
where it used to be, I would get the money over a seven year period. So what's the issue for me now as the lender? Whether in the Great Depression, I keep a job for that amount of time and consistently pay? Well, that's what the FHA said they would help. Okay. There's another issue here for me as the bank as a business. Remember, before I was getting 20, 40% yeah. of payments and I was getting all my money back in seven years. Yeah. So when the next guy wanted to borrow money, wasn't an issue for me. Now I'm lending money to people who aren't paying me back in 30 years. So what's my issue? Having enough of uh, uh, having enough to loan. Exactly. There you go. So now I don't have the money to lend out to the next guy. So my business model is kind of screwed by this. Yeah. So the FHA, right, insured the lenders from loss. Now keep note, FHA is not a lender. They just insure the lenders from loss. But what this is, is created a situation where I lost capital. I don't have capital to lend out to new people. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. So this is where the secondary market came in. The secondary market's the resale marketplace. They would buy those loans from the FHA, okay, or buy, excuse me, buy those FHA insured loans, let's say that correctly, resell them, and now the lenders have the capital to lend money. Okay. Does that make sense? Makes sense. And now you know why when I started this lesson, I said think of it as the resale marketplace. Okay. So essentially, I could lend you money, and I need the money back, so I'll resell that loan to the secondary market. They could wait to make money over a longer period of time, over 30 years of the complexity of the stock market. They buy it, and now I have the money to lend out to new people. Sound good? Yep. Now, the FHA insured the lenders from loss, and the FHA made it a very desirable loan to resell the secondary market is insured. But to do that, they have to verify the borrower's employment, have the property appraised by a neutral third party, and have a title search, which shows the history of ownership. Okay. Borrowers charge a one-time upfront insurance premium, and if the borrower defaulted, the FHA would pay the difference. Key point here, FHA does not make loans. You don't go to an FHA office to get a loan. There's no such thing. FHA is an insurance place for lenders. Okay. Okay. So I hope part of this background puts a little more in context for you. It does. The secondary market. Yeah. Okay. Nineteen thirty-nine, Fannie Mae um, bought FHA insured loans from lenders. This is a government institution. And you ever heard of the VA? Yeah. What's the VA? Veterans Association. Yeah, so the veterans returned from war in 1935. Fannie Mae agreed to buy VA guaranteed loans the lender had negotiated. Fannie Mae buys mortgages on the secondary market, pulls them together, then sells them back into mortgage securities to investors on the open market. That's a little more complicated way of saying what I was saying before. How they take the loans, they create them, sell them on the secondary market, and then they have the capital in order to make more loans. Okay? Yeah, I get it. You're going to hear a term called warehousing. Have you heard this term before? No. Warehousing is when they package the loans and sell them in a book group. Kind of like when you buy a six pack of soda, what's cheaper, buying a six pack of soda or buying six individual sodas? Six pack. Right. So warehousing is like a six pack of sodas. Okay. Okay. And they sell them on the secondary market. They package the loans, they sell them all in one. Jeannie Mae is a federally owned corporation, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and they insure liquidity. Do you know what the word liquidity means? Um, I, I think in ter terms of if you liquefy whatever you own, what it's worth. Yeah, it basically turns things into cash. Right. It makes the money more movable. Just think of the word liquid. What does liquid mean to you? You think of the word liquid. Flow. Flow. Exactly. It moves easily. So when you think of liquidity for money, just think of it like liquid. It flows easily. It can be easily moved. 
In summary, secondary market resells loans to which help provide funds to lenders. Oh my gosh, please excuse my spelling error. Everybody who sees this, do not spell resell with an L in there. <laughs> okay. So disclosure, I have identified my error. So don't, don't put all the comments on YouTube, please. Carol, do you see any other errors here so people don't trash me on YouTube? Uh, let's see, secondary market resells loans to which help to which helps provide funds for lenders. I can put a period on the end, but on that, we're okay. See how smart I am? You think I misspelled, but really, I just made you reread that sentence for everybody watching this on YouTube. Okay. See, that was all pre-thought, so haha, -ha, everybody on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Here's your favorite part, questions. Dun, 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 dun. So unfortunately, we're going to expose your weakness, but I want to congratulate you if I do expose your weaknesses or helping a lot of people, including myself as a teacher and other people trying to learn. And I'll do these questions with you, so I'll help explain concepts as we're working on them. Okay. All right, so just do your best, and don't be afraid to get it wrong, because rather get it wrong now than on your exam. Fair enough. All right, why don't you read this out loud? In which of the following markets may a lender sell a loan that a mortgage banker has previously originated? Hmm. Secondary market. Look at you, you're already doing well. 100%. Okay, why do you circle secondary market? Because that's what we've been talking about. And what I'm getting at, and I'll say this a lot as you prepare for your exam, if something's familiar to you, circle it. Do you never circle things that you've never heard of before. Because if you study a lot for this exam, you're going to see things that become familiar. If something in your exam you've never seen before, that means it's not in your material, you don't need to know it, don't circle it. Okay? Okay. Okay, which of the following markets may a lender sell a loan that a mortgage banker has previously originated? What's the answer? Secondary market. Boom. Okay, great. A VA loan may be granted for the purchase of a one to four family. Okay. A VA loan may be granted for the purchase of a one family or four family property. Yes. What do you think? How long? Um, how much longer do we got of it? The down payment will be at least 10%. No, no so the answer here is the veteran agrees to live there. We did okay. not talk about that in the lesson, so don't That's feel true, bad. we didn't, I guessed. Right, so don't feel bad about getting that wrong. Okay. What I want you to learn from this is you're getting tested primarily on residential no, real estate. Okay. So remember that. People live in residential real estate. The okay. VA insures loans, but they're not insuring loans so people can make money. They're insuring loans so people have a place to live. It's making sure veterans have a home, not making sure veterans can get nice income properties and things of that nature. Okay. All right. That's why I default to the answers on your exam will usually revolve around people's residence, not collecting rent or things of that nature. Now that's not always the case, but it's a good rule of thumb to follow as you prepare it. Okay, I'll remember that. Okay, so with that being said, what's the answer here going off what I just explained to you? Which of the following <laughs> loans would be most likely to qualify for FHA insurance? It would be a loan to purchase one to four units of residential rental property. Right, and what we're getting at here, we didn't talk about a lot about that, but going off that rule of thumb I just gave you, you're saying, you know, I'm not sure here, but going off that rule of thumb about residential real estate, there it is. That's exactly what I did. Yeah, and so that will really help you as you prepare for your exam. Which of the following statement is most accurate concerning mortgage bankers? Uh, 
They negotiate loans which are readily saleable in the secondary mortgage market. You just got another one right. I want you to remember, you said you do nothing when you started this lesson. Sure. It's either I'm a great teacher or you need more confidence. Let's go with both. Okay. Lenders who deal directly with the borrowers make up the... Um... Probably to the primary mortgage market. I love that you got that right. You didn't automatically circle secondary market because you paid attention and you said secondary market is the resale marketplace. So that's not dealing directly with borrowers. So the primary mortgage market is the answer there. That's exactly how I thought. Excellent. What you're also learning is in order to pass this exam, if you know a few simple rules of thumb and you know some key words and know some key concepts, you could get by and you'll be okay. So as we started with you when we started this lesson, there's a feeling of insecurity. And my hope as you're doing this, you get a little more confident saying, you know, I can handle this if I just understand some important concepts that are relevant to what we're doing here. Which of the following loans on a home would probably be made without requiring a down payment from the borrower? VA. I don't know how you got that right, but you did. VA, that's well as you just got to learn. VA does not require a down payment. Just well, out of curiosity, we did not, I did not say that in the lesson. How did you come up with VA? What was your thought process? Well, you we were talking about the previous question and the <clears throat> and the uh, that the idea was just to give someone a residence. And we were talking about veterans. So in a way it was an educated guess that the veterans that this would apply to the veterans. Excellent. Good. So the other thing you see is GNMA is Ginny May. We learned before they buy things on the secondary market, right? Okay. Yeah. Conventional, we haven't heard that word. We didn't right. mention that today. FHA you learned about. Right. So then remember I said FHA being a small down payment. I told you that story of the is 24%. I didn't say FHA said no down payment. I said it was much smaller down payment. Okay. And so you came up with VA. Right. My reactivity is a Fannie Mae and secondary market involves which one? Um FHA loans only? Government insured and guaranteed loan, which FHA is one of. All right. Just for the record, if this was your exam, you are passing your exam so far. Okay. Like that little animation there? Yeah. Any May, Federal National Award Association primarily created to. Um, let's see. It, it would be, uh, it would either be A or C. So increase the availability of secondary financing or serve as a secondary mortgage market. I think I'm going to um, go with A. You're so close. Increase the availability of secondary financing. That yeah. would increase the people like on the stock market's ability to buy things. It's nothing to do with them. Okay. So it serves as a secondary market, but your thinking okay. was great. All right, the key word was mortgage market. Okay, got it. I see where I messed up. All the following are considered advantages of FHA except. Um, the, let's see. Um, the buyer is protected with FHA insurance. You were doing awesome. Why did you answer that one? Because it's the lender that's protected by the FHA insurance. I am so impressed with you. That is great. And you swear, when we started this, you said you knew nothing about the secondary market, correct? Correct. You're killing it. 
purchaser of a home five years ago is now interested in securing an FHA. All right, so <clears throat> I know that is a great video, <laughs> and that y'all wanted to finish it up, but I'm gonna. I know y'all have a test, uh, and I'm gonna let y'all go ahead and get to work on that. So uh, that'll be the end of class for the night. Um, I hope you all have a good rest of the night. We're gonna cut the recording right now. If you don't mind.